the union or WTU appealed to the Privy Council in England and even there they lost their case. Trade unions continued and continued their opposition to the ISC. Finally, in 1972, it was replaced by the Industrial Relations Act, better known as the IRA. But this was only a cosmetic change to the IRC because strike relations, negotiations were still broken down. In its modified form, the IRA has proven to be one of the positive contributions of Williams to industrial dispute resolution. Williams successfully dealt with his political foes, both within the PNM and also in the parliamentary opposition. As maximum leader, his political base was impregnable for 25 years. But the force which continued to be the greatest nuisance, the singular threat, was the labor, the unions, the working class. In addition to union rivalry, a significant factor was the differing ethnic bases, African and Indians, which polarized the two major unions. The political maneuvers of labor leaders indicated their determination not merely to improve the conditions of the working class, but to wrest power from Dr. Eric Williams. I will, I will illustrate this from three definitive periods during the Williams regime. Firstly, the CLR James OWTU Alliance of 1965. The alleged communist activities of James were a cause of concern among PNM members who felt he was spreading communist ideas and also influencing communists in the party. In October 1966, at a PNM meeting in Faisabad, Williams assured his listeners he would crush any Marxist movement in Trinidad. Williams accused James as using the sugar belt, the sugar workers as pawns. James attempted to infiltrate and gain control of the powerful OWTU with its 10,000 members. It was alleged that James and the OWTU helped to create communist cells in Faisabad, Pointe Pierre, and San Fernando. When he left the PNM, labor leaders considered this advantageous in the struggle between labor and government. James did not hesitate to use labor as a springboard for his final political challenge to Williams. In pursuance of his resolve to dethrone Williams, James teamed up with Stephen Maharaj to form the Workers and Farmers Party in 1965 with plans to form the government. The Workers and Farmers Party contested the national elections in 1966. The party received a dismal 3% of the votes. Secondly, the Black Power Movement created a serious challenge to the Williams regime in February 1970. Massive demonstrations, public marches, with elements of militancy, threatened national security. There were demonstrations. 20,000 persons marched from Port of Spain to Samoa. Black power forces were further empowered when labor joined the bandwagon. Oil, sugar, transport, and electrical workers were soon supporting the militant black power groups. After weeks of unrest interspersed with fire bombings of certain banks and shops, particularly in Port of Spain, the next weapon against the government was a general strike planned for the 21st and the 22nd of April, 1970. Williams did not hesitate. A state of emergency was declared on the 21st of April and extended to November, 1970. President George Weeks of the OWTU and 15 black power leaders were arrested and placed in the Royal Jail in Port of Spain and the Nelson Island Prison. On the morning of the 21st of April 1970, a section of the Trinidad Defense Force mutinied 
but was intercepted by the Coast Guard at Shagaramas and the mutineers arrested. If the military dissidents had been allowed to join the Black Power demonstrations, their combined forces would have certainly precipitated violent confrontation. But Williams was prepared. A naval vessel was anchored offshore. Furthermore, Williams did not hesitate to crush and incarcerate all insurrectionists, whether trade unionists, soldiers, university students, or lecturers. Whether the revolution was ideological, political, or social, Williams did not care. During this period of instability, Williams introduced the Public Order Bill in 1970. The bill was designed to give unlimited powers to the police, with powers of entry and powers to seize and unrest. The Defense Force was given additional powers. The bill was described as draconian and repressive. Williams was accused of creating a police state to entrench his supposedly dictatorial governance. The bill was luckily withdrawn in October 1970 when some measure was restored with the incarceration of leaders and when black power demonstrations subsided. Not surprisingly, during the latter part of the 1970, the oil field workers trade union suffered their print tree and headquarters at San Fernando was firebombed, burned. Union books were seized by the police. The days of terror continued for the unions until 1971. Thirdly, the United Labour Front, or the ULF of 1975, created serious problems for Williams in another fierce encounter with the forces of labor. On the 18th of February, 1975, the largest labor rally ever held in Trinidad and Tobago brought together the OWTU and the two most powerful sugar unions. The OWTU was led by George Weeks, and Basley Upandi led the All Trinidad Sugar Estates and Factory Workers Union. The Trinidad Islandwide Cane Farmers Association was led by Rafiq Shah, an ex-army lieutenant of the 1970 catastrophe. At a rally of 25,000 persons in Skinner Park, San Fernando, the oil workers met in support of Sugar, who had planned a strike against Carony Limited, which was jointly owned by the government and the British firm Tate and Lyle. In that massive labor rally, one section was Indian and rural. The other was urban and Afro-Trinidadian. The rally gave birth to a new political party, the United Labor Front, Except the 1970 black power efforts at African Indian unity, the rally was, I quote, the only time that these two ethnic groups had come together to oppose the government, end of quote. Rafik Shah said at the rally, we must now consolidate and institutionalize the power we now have to get control of the state, end of quote. The rally sent clear signals to Williams that his most formidable foe had an unmistakable political agenda, namely to wrest political power from him. Both unions, oil field and sugar, were against the multinational corporations and accused Williams of inviting them to Trinidad. He was reminded of the famous Shagarama's declaration when he supported local ownership. Furthermore, in 1956 and 1970, he indicated his support for trade union participation in the economy, in profit sharing and bonuses. Obviously, Williams had now broken that promise. The unions condemned Williams for inviting foreign companies whereas Venezuela 
was nationalizing its industries. With threats of a national strike, Williams was prepared for a showdown. On Tuesday, the Mar on Tuesday March the 18th, 1975, a prayer rally, a religious rally, was organized for oil field workers at the OWTU. This crippled the oil belt. Refri refineries at Brighton and Point Pier were shut down. Weeks, George Weeks, president of the OWTU, insisted this rally was for peace, bread, and justice. The United Labour Front was not merely challenging the British sugar giant Tate and Lyle, but also the Williams administration. On Tuesday, the ULF planned its religious march from San Fernando to Port of Spain with 26,000 oil and sugar workers. Police stopped the march in San Fernando using tear gas to disperse the crowd. The police beat members of that crowd with batons, rifle butts. Williams had stopped the unions, but he was severely reprimanded for these incidents, better known as Bloody Tuesday. The political coalition of the United Labour Front, though a political force, was mortally wounded in the 1976 general elections. It managed to gain only 10 seats with the Democratic Action Congress, winning two seats while the Williams PNM continued to romp home with 24 seats. As a historian, Williams was undoubtedly sympathetic with the working class as he understood the vicissitudes of workers under the yoke of colonialism. Indeed, he began his career as a friend of the labor movement in Trinidad and Tobago. As a politician, he knew of the potential of a united labor front mobilized as a force against him. Glimpses of his benevolence indicate cautious tokenism in the Senate appointments or inclusion in the PNM's central executive. He was always prepared to jealously guard the supremacy of his party, the PNM. As Prime Minister, when his political position was threatened by Labour or anyone else, he did not hesitate to adopt repressive measures because even in dealing with labor, when his political turf was invaded, there was little room for compassion or compromise. As a nationalist, he identified radical, militant, and politically inclined unionists as dangerous forces to the national well-being, and he regarded them as enemies of the state. This diminutive giant of West Indian politics never surrendered without a fight, and labor leaders knew of his fortitude. I thank you.